Linda Moulton Howe is an investigative journalist and an award-winning documentary filmmaker, particularly lauded for her early coverage of the taboo topic of cattle mutilations. Click on the timestamp in the description if you'd like to skip this intro. My name is Kurt Scheimungle. I'm a Torontonian filmmaker with a background in mathematical physics dedicated to the explication of the variegated terrain of theories of everything. From a theoretical physics perspective, but as well as analyzing consciousness and seeing its potential connection to fundamental reality, whatever that is. Essentially, this channel is dedicated to exploring the underived nature of reality, the constitutional laws that govern it, provided those laws exist at all and are even knowable to us. If you enjoy witnessing and engaging with others on the topics of psychology, consciousness, physics, etc., the channel's themes, then do consider going to the Discord and the subreddit, which are linked in the description. There's also a link to the Patreon, that is patreon.com slash if you'd like to support this podcast, as the patrons and the sponsors are the only reasons that I'm able to have podcasts of this quality and this depth, given that I can do this now full-time, thanks to both the patrons and the sponsors' support. Now with regard to sponsors, there are three. The first sponsor is Shortform. Shortform is a place to go if you don't have the time or the inclination to read an entire book, yet you want to get the gist of it so that you can be conversant as if you've read it. I mean that in an extremely positive sense, and you'll hear more about Shortform toward the middle of the podcast. The second sponsor is Brilliant. During the winter break, I decided to brush up on some of the fundamentals of physics, particularly with regard to information theory, as I'd like to interview Chiara Marletto on constructor theory, which is heavily based in information theory. Now, information theory is predicated on entropy. At least there's a fundamental formula for entropy. So I ended up taking the brilliant course. I challenged myself to do one lesson per day, and I took the courses random variable distributions and knowledge slash uncertainty. What I loved is that despite knowing the formula for entropy, which is essentially hammered into you as an undergraduate, it seems like it comes down from the sky arbitrarily. And with Brilliant, for the first time, I was able to see how the formula for entropy, which you're seeing right now, is actually extremely natural, and it'd be strange to define it in any other manner. There are plenty of courses, and you can even learn group theory, which is what's being referenced when you hear that the standard model is predicated on U1 cross SU2 cross SU3. Those are Lie groups, continuous Lie groups. Visit brilliant.org slash toe, T-O-E, to get 20% off an annual subscription. And I recommend that you don't stop before four lessons. I think you'll be greatly surprised at the ease at which you can now comprehend subjects you previously had a difficult time grokking. The third sponsor is Algo. Now, Algo is an end-to-end -end supply chain optimization software software company with software that helps business users optimize sales and operations, planning to avoid stockouts, reduce return and inventory write-downs while reducing inventory investment. It's a supply chain AI that drives smart ROI, headed by Amjad Hussein, who's been a huge supporter of this podcast since near its inception. In fact, Amjad has his own podcast on AI and consciousness and business growth, and if you'd like to support the Toe podcast then visit the link in the description to see Amjad's podcast because subscribing to him, or at least visiting, supports the Toe podcast indirectly. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, Linda. How are you? Hi, Kurt. I also heard that it was... Uh, I also heard you turned 45 yesterday, so happy birthday. <laughs> 80 revolutions around the sun. My brother and I were celebrating in Santa Fe and we had a wonderful time. And I am so grateful because the number doesn't mean anything to me. I've never felt stronger. Oh, great. I have never had more energy oh, about that's, well, that's great to feeling know. that I am so close to being alive when the headline hits that we're not alone in this universe. It's, it's preposterous that that still is the superimposed, um, we'll say, government sanctioned point of view. So it is uh, interesting to me that at this point that my vitality and energy for doing 18 hour days is probably better than it ever was. <laughs> Did you happen to see any of the Theories of Everything podcast prior to this? N no, and I still haven't. And it's not being rude to you. No, it is comment for time. On the same thing yeah. you experienced that uh, I literally do work 18 hour days all of the time. Well, it's thank you for not under so duress. Much. It's just so much. Okay. If you can see or hear this, type in Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon into the live chat. Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon. We're live. Linda, welcome. Thank you, Kurt. I'm glad to be here. 
Just making sure it's all copacetic on my end. Okay. So, Linda, I watched A Strange Harvest, and I saw there was this lady who, via hypnotherapy, was able to see a cow being abducted, and I'm wondering if there are any other cases of people seeing a cattle being mutilated or being taken, but not in some pulse-induced altered state. Probably one of the most interesting aspects at the beginning of the research, when I started calling sheriffs and deputies back in for the first time, September of 1979, I was provoked by headlines that were in Colorado newspapers and television using the word animal mutilations returned. And I had been doing medical programming for the ABC station in Boston, had moved to Denver and was hired to be director of special projects, but I was personally not aware of the animal mutilation phenomena, having been working at KNBC in Los Angeles and WCBB in Boston. So that when I saw these headlines, the first thing that I did was contact sheriffs in some of the counties that were listed. And one of them was Sheriff Tex Graves up in Logan County in Colorado and um, drove up for a, probably, a, it was about a three or four hour meeting in which he brought out Polaroids and documents and he had been investigating animal mutilation since uh, I think it was 1970 or 71. And I'm now a decade later in his office asking him as director of special projects. It was Sheriff Tex Graves who told me, Linda, I'll save you some time. The perpetrators are creatures from outer space. And then he began to tell me why, which included his own interviews with ranchers that he had gone out to investigate bloodless, trackless mutilations, who said, at night, I saw a beam. I saw a beam coming out of something circular in the night sky. It was coming down into the pasture. The rancher would say, I was terrified, ran back to the ranch house. And then when the sun came up, went out, and there was one of his cattle bloodlessly mutilated, meaning an ear is taken on the sky facing. The animals are usually on one side and it's the sky facing that always is where the ear is taken, the eye is taken, sometimes a circle of flesh around the eye, the jaw, like a keyhole. They called it the keyhole cut where it's like this and everything is removed and fresh shining bone and was one of the points that Sheriff Tex Grave said, not only were the ranchers reporting that they were seeing beams of light coming into their pasture where they would find a mutilated animal, but you can ask a veterinarian, how would you get this tissue off of a jawbone when of the only way to get a jawbone clean and polished is to boil? And that is not happening between in the hours between the day and when they're found in the morning. And when this one particular rancher, the Sheriff Tex Graves was saying, saw the beam of light, eventually I would hear in uh, discussions with other sheriffs and deputies where they would be talking with a, a rancher who would say they saw an animal rise in the beam of light but it was not a cell phone age. We're talking about the early seventies. So you have human testimony of what they have seen, but you do not have video recordings or photographs. And I think it was the Sheriff Tex Graves comment, Linda, I'll save you some time. The perpetrators are creatures from outer space. And that was to me, the most shocking statement to me in the very first interview with a sheriff that I conducted. Did the person see an eight, a cattle a cow going up, or he just saw the beam at that point? That particular rancher saw the beam. Others would then later on tell me about how they saw an animal rise or be lowered. And in uh, my work, uh, glimpses of other realities, uh, high strangeness, and in facts and eyewitnesses, it's a two-volume book. 
there is a story uh, out of uh, Oregon. And that was an eyewitness that I was able to interview. He was working as a ranch hand, was staying out in a trailer house where they had uh, some cattle that might uh, be giving birth. And so he would stay out to help if, if anything happened with the cattle. And he was, uh, he started hearing a sound and couldn't understand what he was hearing on a clear night. It sounded like branches breaking and he left the trailer house and to his complete and total astonishment, he was seeing uh, a light, there was a beam, but cattle were dropping from whatever this light was in the sky, they were dropping down through the trees, breaking branches. And it was like, like 11 animals that he himself watched mm -hmm. drop from the sky. And that was uh, in Southeastern Oregon. And it's one of the uh, cases that I have documented by talking with him and others who were in Oregon at the time. And the animal mutilations have had cyclings in certain areas, whether it's the United States, Canada, Mexico, Central America, cycling South America. with respect to time. Uh, that they, what do you mean with cycling? Global, it is a global phenomena that cycles. If uh, in this instance, like I can think of times, uh, there was a, a rancher named Blazing Game. And he had a big ranch uh, that was north of Colorado Springs in Colorado. And I interviewed him when I was working on my documentary, A Strange Harvest. And then about three years later, he called me at the station. And he said, I want you to know that hill pasture that we talked about where I had the mutilations. He said, this year, I decided I was not going to put any cattle on that hill pasture. And Linda, this is the first year in four years I have not had a mutilation. And that has always been, to me, another one of those data points that has been puzzling, that you get the sense in the animal mutilations as if there was a grid on the planet and that certain latitude longitudes would continue to repeat over time, where a rancher would say, I had the uh, mutilations on in this pasture and no other pastures on that hill pasture. And that is also a puzzle. Why do you it think that is, is? Well, if we are dealing with extraterrestrial biological entities, as Sheriff Tex Grave said, their approach to our planet could be, let's say, Let's say, because one of the hypotheses is that the reason for the animal mutilations relates to the fact that the gray beings that have been re probably reported more than any other in abductions and have been seen. Uh, uh, two cowboys in Colorado, uh, they were reported and called the uh, sheriff that they saw two small gray beings literally float in the air up over a corral fence and down into a corral, scared them and they ran away. And then they come back and there is a mutilated cow in the corral. So they had a direct link with the gray beings. Um, that one of the hypotheses is that um, all these different types that are reported around the world, gray types, reptilian types, tall blondes, tall whites, all of these different types of beings, that there may be an evolutionary relationship between say grays that may have been working on our planet for centuries, maybe thousands and thousands of years. We are a species that has only existed on earth for 45,000 years in the crossfade with Neanderthalensis. So we would not have any firsthand information about what was happening on our earth in terms of extraterrestrials and animal mutilations uh, prior to, let's say the 20th century. And one of the hypotheses is that the harvest may be because there are certain chemicals that beings that have been on this planet for 
millennia may have developed that they had a need for something to be healthy and that they can only get it from earth life. And that that is why there is this periodic cyclic global harvest of blood and tissue from animals, both uh, domestic and wild. The uh, Forest Service had photographs of deer, elk, other places, kangaroos, uh, reindeer. Are there ever small animals like rats or cats? Cats cut in half all over the planet, usually leaving the front half more than the back half. No blood inside, no organs inside. That's part of the animal mutilations. Uh, a marmot. A marmot was reported in Aspen, Colorado to me. Uh, it was a Forest Service guy and he found the marmot laid out on a rock and it had the same ear, eye, jaw. So here's this little animal that had the same excisions as the large animal. They're all mammals? Um, no, because I think... Well, what category would you put a kangaroo in? Mammal. Okay. Okay, so they're not reptiles. There have been uh, snakes in England that have been found where a fox was mutilated or a, a rabbit was mutilated and then they would find nearby a reptile snake that was cut with organs removed very specifically from inside the snake with no blood and no fluid and completely dry. You mentioned that there was a report of two grays and then they came and floated. And I imagine that they're floating without a beam. So the beam was to bring up a cow to make a cow float. So they can float on their own without light, let's say. Is there a difference between a ground mutilation and one that takes place in the craft itself? I don't know beyond the fact that in my earthfiles.com, I have about 3,000 in-depth reports in science and environment and real X-files. And there is a fascinating report where there were two men, they had gone out to hunt and they uh, were in sleeping bags and they both become aware that, that there is some kind of a beam that is taking one of the hunters up out of a sleeping bag, the other watches. And then they both find themselves inside of a craft. And that was a case where a cow was all hooked up to tubes to a strange technology. And their testimony was that telepathically that they were receiving information from a clearly looking standing up uh, alligator lizard type. This is what we do. We, we take your, this animal and it's important that it remain alive while we are removing the fluids. It's the only case that I know of where there was a effort to try to communicate to humans who were watching a process of uh, lifting. This was a cow going up in a beam of light. Uh, that the hunters saw, and then showing what had happened. Now, why that would be, that is part of the mystery. Why is it that, the, for the most part, animal mutilations have taken place around the planet, usually in what would be the dark hours of night, that would be the general, and then the animals found in the morning. But in these cases, which are not many, where there have been humans who see the beam in this case, the only case I know where two men are then up inside of the craft and being shown, this is what we do. Why did that happen? And why hasn't it happened on lots of other cases? It is part of the mystery of non-human intelligences who have been interacting with this planet from government uh, testimony to me, from people who have worked in NSA, CIA, DIA, saying, uh, as one man told me in December of 1999, uh, he was retiring from the Defense Intelligence Agency. And we had a seven hour meeting that took a month to put together. Uh, and he said, 
uh, that the, uh, the whole issue of how long all of this had been going on, he said, our government has proof that three extraterrestrial civilizations have been competing with each other and in conflict on our planet for at least 270 million years. And when I said, what is the proof? He said, Linda, if I told you, it would be a danger to you and to me both. But 270 million years is going back before the time of the dinosaurs. Did they give any indication that the cows were being lowered slower when you said that they heard rustling when the cows were being lowered into some ground? Are they being, are they being dropped? Or are they being lowered slowly? I've heard both. Uh, the one in uh, Oregon, that was the first hand, uh, the cowboy watching because he heard the breaking limbs and sees the animals dropping. He could see a beam, but they were being dropped from the beam through the trees. Other cases, people see the, like the Linda Porter case that you mentioned, she and her daughter see a calf rising up in a beam of light. And then they find themselves in the craft with gray beings that are taking thin slices from testicles and other organs uh, that they associate with the calf that they saw go up in the beam of light. So you have variations on watching something be lowered. I've had cases, they've seen it lowered all the way, but the rancher becomes terrified and runs back to a ranch house and does not come back to that pasture till the sun is up and then they find a mutilated animal. Other people see them dropped and, uh, and why, for the most part, the vast majority don't see either. They find the animals. What's meant precisely when you say that there is no blood? I've heard this many times. So does that mean that if I was to take my finger and touch the inside that it would come out without any red? Or is it just that there isn't a drastic amount of blood? It's radically reduced. Uh, you have uh, one or two of my books and you look at the photographs and you see an excision, eye, ear, the jaw, the genitals, the rectum, over and over, thousands and thousands of photos around the world the same. There's not even fluid. There's no blood. There's no blood oozing. There's no blood on the ground. Everything is dry. What about urine or excrement? I don't recall, I don't think, a single animal mutilation case uh, because usually in 90% of the cases, the rectal tissue is removed. And that means it's a hole and there's no blood and there's no fluid. And as a lot of sheriffs have said to me, it felt like sandpaper to touch the tissue. It was so dry. You mentioned that Trump knows more about UFOs than he lets on. Why do you think that? Oh, I guess it's because I have had conversations with people who have worked in intel agencies during the Trump administration. And they have said that the current administration knows more than they're saying. And it was in the context of my asking, do you think that uh, President Trump will be the administration to announce that we're not alone in this universe? And so that would be the discussion. And then people would say, well, he knows more than he says. So I'm just going through my notes here. You mentioned once that, or at least, at least once, that arts parts will levitate in the presence of a certain magnetic field. And I'm assuming that's at room temperature. Now, what makes you say this? Where did you get that from? The bismuth magnesium zinc layered material It came in two sections. Uh, it was 1996, April, and I was doing uh, probably two, two to three programs with Art Bell almost every month at that time. And the first shipment that came was a medal that I got to Alcoa, 
aluminum to find out what it was because we figured it was aluminum and Alcoa came back and said, where did you get this? It's 99.74% pure aluminum and we don't manufacture aluminum at this purity. And then within two or three weeks after getting the aluminum and my starting the research and reporting pretty much pretty regularly with art on coast to coast and another show we did called Dreamland came another shipment. And by then I had established with um, a professor that I knew through crop circle investigations at the University of Michigan. We got a second box and it was clearly more complex, layered pieces, silver on one side, black on the other. And I called the professor at the University of Michigan and said, we've got a second box. Can you take a look at a piece I'm gonna send you and see if we can get elements, uh, do, do some electron microscopy, all of which he could do at the university. That led to, in my books, you see the analysis that it was 97.6% a layer in one of the layers in the silver and black. And the 97.6% was magnesium, 2.4% zinc. So it was like an alloy in one layer that was silver. The next layer was only one to four microns. It was extremely thin and it was bismuth. So we had alternating layers of bismuth magnesium with, uh, with a magnesium zinc with bismuth approximately 26 layers making these silver and black pieces that were maybe a little less than a quarter of an inch thick. And there were several in this box. As soon as I began reporting what the professor was finding in terms of the elements, I started getting phone calls and emails from people saying, we know from our research that what you have is uh, going to be from the bottom of a craft. Well, it turned out that we had a letter that came fr uh, from a diary of a, a grandfather who had worked in security at Roswell, according to the sender who was a army sergeant at the time, I got to talk with him on the phone. And he said, my grandfather, uh, said this was in one of the crashes in 47 and that he and men were assigned to ring a wedge-shaped craft that glowed with light underneath for about four hours and essentially that the grandfather left his uh, relative this diary saying that he had done something that would get anybody else in real trouble he had gone over and with his own hand had pulled some of the bottom that was glowing of this craft. And these are the pieces that were in a box. And so we had the diary that said that the uh, black and silver pieces came from the bottom of a wedge shaped craft. And eventually within a very short period of time of my reporting these various pieces and questions on the air, what could this be? Hal Putoff, uh, who is a physicist who has worked on many, many UFO related subjects, he got in touch with me and said, Linda, I would like to be able to study this uh, bismuth magnesium zinc material. And Hal Putoff and people who are working in semiconductors, I started getting requests from a variety of different scientists. And then we started cutting pieces of these originals so that I could send them out with uh, releases that everybody would return what they were studying to me, which is how I kept them for the pieces for 20 years. What I began to uh, realize that from the people who were getting the material and that I was working with, they started talking about we think that this is material 
that interacts with a field that would neutralize gravity. That's, that's how all of it, very complex series of tests and reports evolving into people saying this material in a field, but what is the field? We never were able to demonstrate this, never. But that was the context from people who had other information that the bismuth magnesium zinc. So now jump to today in 2022. There are all kinds of reports that have been emerging in the last year or two about bismuth and magnesium being one of the keys to certain kinds of skins that have been verified in UFOs that would have some relationship to neutralizing gravity in very specific fields. So that's what's happened from 1996 up to 2022, an evolution of a whole variety of researchers. And now today, there are people who are willing to say that. I was looking into the research on this and I couldn't find any published research, only reports of other people like Hal put off saying, well, it, it, right. it displays anti-gravitic properties. However, a published piece of research was by Mick West, and he showed that some of the images of the aluminum art parts, they looked like a fin sheet, which is found in car radiators in around the year 1925 I don't or know so. what you're, re I do not know what you're referring to. I know that uh, my work with a professor at the University of Michigan was the very first work. There, there was no, uh, no other. And that was done, we had electron microscope images. We had uh, microscope images. We were doing periodic table uh, element uh, analyses that led to my uh, talking with Art and saying, look, I would like to find out from somebody who, uh, where we could do um, an um, ion microprobe, which is a very sophisticated instrument and find out if there is anything in the magnesium that might be outside of what is considered normal magnesium on the earth. And that is one of the elements that had come up in other UFO stories in previous years, where a famous case down in South America, there was a magnesium dropped from a UFO onto a beach. And it turned out that one of the reports was that it was not earth-based ratios. Well, that led to Art and I uh, split the, the cost of it. I remember it was an $850 bill and we split it for me to go to Carnegie Institute in Washington, DC that had at that time in July of 1996, the only ion microprobe that would be able to do a study of the magnesium and the bismuth and uh, the uh, the bismuth, the magnesium, and the zinc. And it was about a seven or eight hour that I was there at Carnegie Institute. And at one point, I remember the ion microprobe uh, technical guy said, you know, I don't think in all of my work here, I do not think I've ever looked at a thin bismuth layer like this, one to four microns where I did not find also lead atoms present because on a periodic table, bismuth and lead are right next to each other. And they would normally find some lead with bismuth. And with regard to that in particular, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to hurry this along. So Mick West, in his, and I'm, you're saying that you haven't seen the analysis by Mick West. And from my reading of it, it seems like what's been displayed in arts parts, at least part of it is like I mentioned, what can be found in fin sheet and car radiators in the 1920s. And there's a, no, the, the refinement of, of if, lead. If I could just, fin if sure, I could sure, just sure. finish on the ion microprobe, uh, it's the, uh, it's the most sophisticated uh, technical apparatus. And we were looking at the purity or the percentage in the bismuth layer, the zinc layer and the magnesium layer. That's not easy to do. And the ion microprobe that day, when I said it, we, we used it for seven or eight hours. And that uh, when Eric Howery was the ion microprobe 
technician and he was talking about how the bismuth was pure, that he was not finding lead. And it turned out that the magnesium uh, had 11% more magnesium 24 than our baseline magnesium we were using as a comparison. That wasn't enough to kick it into, this is automatically extraterrestrial magnesium, but it was definitely unusual enough for him. He wrote up a report, which I have published in my books, talked about. So the, the elemental compositions of those layers and knowing that the bismuth was one to four microns, this is very thin making up these layers. This was uh, hard data in the period of time that we were receiving this material in 1996. And that is what I was reporting and finding in the electron microscope and eventually at Carnegie Institute. That is why Hal Putoff and other scientists became very interested. And that began the next level of doing agreements where I would send out some of this magnesium bismuth zinc to them to do tests. And they sending back and saying, this is definitely unusual. This is not some uh, deposition as some people tried to say, oh, it's just a layered deposition from a lab. Not, no, that, that's not true. I had a notebook. I think I ended up at the end of uh, 1996 with 119 people and labs that I had gone to getting information about the bismuth magnesium zinc and it included a man and a, an exotic metals manufacturer in New York City. And when I told him what we had found at the University of Michigan and in Carnegie Institute in terms of what these layers were, I remember the man laughed and said, look, I can tell you, you, you can't put bismuth and magnesium together. They will delaminate. And so, we had, uh, we had the hard evidence of what they were made of and what the layers were and how pure they were. But metal, exotic metal manufacturer couldn't even recognize how you would put bismuth and magnesium together in layers. Have you heard of the betterton kroll process? Or has anyone mentioned that to you? Say that again. betterton kroll So it was invented around the 1920s, and it was a way... And it still is a way of refining lead to produce similar amounts of ratios that have been reported. And see, when I watch a show like Forensic Files, sometimes I see, anyone can do this, you can just watch the show Forensic Files. Sometimes you'll see these experts and they'll say, this, I don't know where this came from. This is not even from, this is, and I'm an expert in the field that I've never seen either this isotopic ratio or this amount of percentage of elements in it. And then there's some pedestrian explanation afterward. So even experts can can miss. So that's why I'm wondering if you've heard of Betterton Kroll. It is a lead analysis process? No, it's a refinement. It's a refinement process. That was no. invented around the 1920s or so. No, I mean, you're so far afield from the fundamental original research that was done at the University of Michigan and then Carnegie Institute of pure bismuth in one to four micron layers, and then zinc 2.4%, magnesium 96%, given it has to add up to 100%. And that was repeated at Carnegie Institute. So the only elements present in these layers were the bismuth thin one to four micron layer with the magnesium zinc alternating very regularly black bismuth silver magnesium zinc, a whole series like a tort cake, but only a quarter of an inch high because the layers, the bismuth was so thin. I understand. And those, those, what I'm saying is that was the 1996 original hard evidence that would hold up in a court of law. Uh, this is all that is in these layered metals. 
And so what's happening with those metamaterials right now? Are they simply sitting around? Is the Krata agreement going to produce a public analysis of it? I had uh, the metals working with Hal Putoff and with others up to uh, August of 2018. So I started the, of those years in April of 1996. And by 2018, Hal Putoff had joined with Tom DeLong and Lou Elizondo and others in that To The Stars group where they had a goal that they would take, uh, they would have money, raise money to have exotic technologies examined and then reported to the white world as opposed to being constantly covered up in the black world. That was the concept. And Hal uh, put off, asked me in, uh, a, he'd had the bismuth magnesium zinc three different times, had written up uh, his analysis for me that I had reported and is in my books. And Jacques Vallée in 2017, he had a piece of bismuth magnesium zinc from me for most of that year. And by then it was because if you go from 1996 to 2017 to 2018, there had been more and more information about the role that bismuth might play in terms of neutralizing gravity. And so people who had had the bismuth magnesium zinc 20 years earlier were now coming back and saying, we want to study it more for X, Y, and Z. And by that time, Hal Putoff had written to me and said, I would like to see a study of the bismuth magnesium zinc layered material subjected to terahertz frequency. He said, I think that if we could generate terahertz frequency at this specific level, that this could turn into a lifting body. And terahertz frequency had not even been in the discussion in the 90s. It came in those 2017, 2018 years. And it was also associated terahertz frequency had come up in one of the reports about what might have happened at Bentwaters in England when John Burroughs and others had had encounters with lights. And there was a report that was finally released in the 2012, 2013 period, talking specifically about UFOs emitting terahertz frequency that probably had to do with neutralizing gravity. But what they had learned uh, was that terahertz frequency could damage human hearts or organs that had spaces in them like a heart does at certain levels and frequencies of terahertz that had never been reported prior to 2012 and 13. So coming up even further to 2017 and 2018, Hal had the bismuth magnesium zinc, wanted to try to see if he could get terahertz frequency and they had done tests and they had not been able to generate the terahertz frequency that he wanted. Jacques Vallée had a company on the West Coast. They said they thought they could generate the terahertz frequency. All of the year of 2017, Jacques had trying and they couldn't. Then by then, uh, to the stars, the group that included Hal Putoff, they came to me and said, we have uh, a variety of interests, including other scientists who have information and we would like to be able to work with you as you have with Hal and with Jacques and others. And we will have a piece of bismuth magnesium zinc and we will return it to you because we're now going to try to see if we can match Hal's a projection that if we got terahertz frequencies at a very high level, it could turn into a lifting body. And long story, yeah, long story short, it's been going through all these different rounds of research and being returned to me. And I got a call in the spring of 2018 after To The Stars had gotten a piece that was to come back to me. And they said, 
we still have not been able to find a civilian commercial lab that can project the terahertz frequency at the level we need. But the United States Army is interested. Linda, we can make you a third party to the stars and me and the Army, but we need to be able with your agreement because all these agreements were with me to keep returning the pieces to me over all these years, that if you want to be a third party, we want to send the bismuth magnesium zinc layered piece to the army because they think that they can generate the terahertz frequency. And I asked them, could I think about it for 24 hours? And I thought, if anybody, ends up in an agreement with any of the military branches of the United States, I could not really foresee a, the peace coming back to me. And that's why I proposed that they sell it to me for all of the costs that I had incurred from 1996 to 2018, which was considerable. I traveled, I flew, I took that. So, so a sales, officially on one piece, I still have another piece, went from me to, uh, to the stars and they delivered the piece to the United States Army, which I am assuming it is still there, but they're up to now, as you and I are speaking in January of 2022, I have not heard of any breakthrough on testing the material with terahertz and it turning into an, uh, a body that would float. If it has, they're keeping it close to their chest. I personally have no doubt that a physicist in 2014 at a conference who came to me and said, with a lot of noise around, which was protective, he said, I just want you to know in the 1970s at Area 51, S4 underground. He said, I worked on the layered bismuth and magnesium zinc material. This is in 2014. At S4. This is before everything well, I just finished. the same finished. place that Bob Lazar supposedly yes. worked. And, and this physicist showed me proof that I cannot discuss about what he had done and where he had been. And he said, I had a piece of the bismuth magnesium zinc that was three feet by six feet, Linda. It came off, it was a skin of a wedge-shaped UFO. The diary that came to Art Bell and me in 1996 was typed that this was uh, pulled off of the bottom skin of a wedge-shaped vehicle. Now the physicist is telling me that he had worked with a three foot by six foot piece and that its function was to be in parallel with a pure aluminum. Remember that was the first shipment. The first shipment we got in April of 1996 was an aluminum that Alcoa called me up yep. and said, where did you get this? It was 97.6 or something percent pure aluminum. And uh, Alcoa said, we don't manufacture in this kind of purity. And the physicist is the one who opened up for me why and why these two would have come in the different boxes from the grandfather. The physicist said, what we learned at Area 51 S4 is that it was the pure aluminum that had iridium placed atomically in it, something we cannot do. And it had, a, the pure aluminum was the outside skin, Linda. The bismuth magnesium zinc layered was an inside skin. The two skins of the wedge shaped objects, then in some sort of creation or projection of the terahertz frequency by the craft, with those two skins would turn it into a lifting body. That was from a physicist who proved to me who he was, at, who approached me in 2014, 
So this is a complicated timeline from 1996 getting the physical pieces, the physicist in 2014 telling me what he was able to study and confirm at area uh, 51 S4, and then getting to the year 2017 and 2018 where Jacques Vallée and Hal Putoff and to the stars wanted to study also for the same reason, terahertz frequency mixed with that material could turn it into a lifting body. But as we speak in January of 2022, no one yet has publicly published anything confirming that they have done that. I know that you don't know much about my background, Linda. I, I'm fairly naive in this subject. Uh, my, my knowledge is so rudimentary and there's so many names and so many places, it's difficult for me to contextualize and make sense. So if my questions are come across as, as rude, please forgive me. It's just my, my innocuous naivety. Okay, so well, here's what I, I'm... I sent you my book so you could see the photographs and on the bismuth magnesium. And I will include a link to all of the books and what you've sent me in the description for people who would like to check them out. So here's what I'm wondering. When you sold the materials to Tom DeLong, it sounds like you were aware he was working with the government. However, the government is Oh, I was known. told. Okay, I was great. Told. However, we believe the government to be covering up evidence on this topic. So I'm curious, how did you feel about that? And also, if I go like this, again, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying like, okay, we have to wrap this up because there's so, we have a significant amount yeah. of ground to cover. But I I, I'll just go like, like this it, instead. But I felt like it was unclear on your side and I wanted to make sure that it was clear because this is really important. This material is very, very important. Okay, so how did you feel about that you gave it to someone who was working with the government when we're ambivalent about the government Given that they, I was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a kind of sad irony that from 1996 to 2018, 2018, that I had uh, shepherded these materials all of those years, and had gone to various labs and had worked with even Stephen Chu, the uh, inventor of the, the super semiconductor. And people were looking at it for all kinds of various reasons, not just UFOs uh, and a lifting body. There were lots of scientists very interested in the layered combination. And when Jacques had been so enthusiastic and in 2017 thought that they were going to be able to generate the terahertz that Hal had calculated, and they weren't. And Hal came back and said, we now think we have a lab. It was very clear that the test of the terahertz frequencies at frequencies very near flipping into the frequency of light. Terahertz, look at uh, an electromagnetic spectrum. Terahertz goes right into UV light. And so the, it was an issue of how do you control a certain high frequency of terahertz and direct it into the bismuth magnesium zinc without it flipping into the light frequency. That's as I understand was one of the problems. And so if Jacques Vallée and Hal Putoff had not been able to get the terahertz frequency tests done and to the stars comes and says, the United States army thinks that they can do it now. There is a conflict that I had shepherded this material for a very long time, but there was also the realism. I don't have the ability to generate terahertz frequencies. I don't have labs in which they, I can go into an electron microscopic level. I always was trying to get the to people who would report results. So it seemed to me that it was just a final practical answer that I would sell a piece, keeping another piece. I see, I see. And if the United States Army could solve this, it's my country. This is for our uh, United States of America, if in fact they can crack uh, what this skin and the two skins and terahertz frequencies might produce, that 
it was had come to sort of the end of the road of what to do next, because Hal Putoff and Jacques Vallée were two scientists that seemed like they might have a reasonable chance of getting the, the test done. And then it would have been reported publicly. But it, if I had kept the peace, because I didn't want it going to a military operation, what would I do with it if the major researchers like Hal and Jacques had come to a, a dead end at that point? So that was part of my thinking. So we'll move on from this topic because I feel like I'm harping on it too much. Just so you know, I have an extremely analytical mind, so I like details. We right. can return to it. Okay, let's talk quickly about crop circles, and then we're going to get to some audience questions. What do you believe to be the best hypothesis for why crop circles exist? What are they trying to convey? What is their purpose? On my very first year and first trip to England, it was 1992. And I was out in one of the big patterns that left everybody awestruck because the size and the perfection, no footprints, it, they were astonishing in 1992 at the sort of the beginning of people paying attention. And a man walked over to where I was and he was making comments about it's remarkable, isn't it? There's even three or four layers, there's braiding. And so we're now talking about the astonishing details in a formation. And then he said, well, you know, I, I know somebody who works for the Central Intelligence Agency. He was probably talking about himself. I've had that experience. There will be people who are working in Intel and they'll say, somebody I know who works in Intel, but it's usually their firsthand information. He said, he told me that they're very interested in these crop formations and that they've got a satellite now that is trying to get satellite images of every crop formation that is happening on the world because they are convinced that what we are dealing with is mathematical language from another intelligence that is using the crop formations to judge the accuracy of their travel in time. Can you explain that? Well, he was basically saying that uh, our government in the CIA had come to the conclusion that the astonishing crop formations would be somebody, not Earth, somebody else's test of a time travel technology that was leaving this mathematical language on the surface of the Earth. And I bring that up because that was one of the first discussions that I ever had with anybody on my very first trip to England. And it set a tone that you, when you were in those crop formations in 92, this is before all of the uh, team Satan hoaxers that came into the fields in 95 and 96 and were apparently deliberately trying to destroy or whatever they were doing. 92 was a year where crop formations were, it was very pure. The, there were no hoaxers, there were no, nothing about what would come three or four years later. And that man talking to me about the idea that we could be looking at a mathematical language that was being used to test time travel. For me, it was like a sudden, wow. I never ever would have thought that way about crop formations. And so he gave me a gift. It, oh. was, it was first trip, one of the first formations I was in. I have that discussion and it, uh, so uh, it's so stretched my mind to looking at crop formations differently, for which I'm very grateful because eventually I was in England uh, studying crop formations, doing soil collections, seed collections for uh, the biophysicist in Michigan, Michigan, W.C. Lovingood. I was very, very involved every summer from 92 until uh, probably up through 1999. I went every summer 
and I was involved in the studies and the scientific analysis and how we found there was coatings of iron on seed heads that no one knew how all of it. And eventually uh, I would say that I, I personally had in my hands, walked with my feet through woven where it would be just like a perfect if you were weaving, but 300 feet in diameter or 500 feet in diameter, the patterns could be huge with perfect weaving, but it would be not just the surface weaving. You would get down and lift up the surface that would be woven just like a braid. And then there would be a whole other layer that was coming at 90 degree angles and you would lift that up. Some of these were 12 inches down before you could get to soil. Yeah. And every layer, maybe two or three inches times four or five, it would be a different angle, different pattern, and it would be four or five deep. How in the world would anybody do that and not leave tracks? And I think that it, it really shifted into a whole other gear for me that year in 92 when uh, I went with a group to Milk, uh, it was Milk Hill, a place where there were crop formations every year, it turned out later. And it was our very first uh, pattern. We had met uh, people from the United States and England. And you parked up here on top of the hill and you came in to the top of the hill where the white horse was. And then you're looking down on this. It was a 400, I think it was 430 feet long, bigger than a football field. And this was spirals of circles and paths, it was huge. This is the very first crop formation. And I started down one of the tram lines because we were all trying to make sure the farmers knew that we were not going to tread on any crop. And I started down one of the um, tram lines and the group behind me, they started going down different tram lines. So each one of us was coming down to this huge formation in different tram lines. And when I got down to where I wanted to try to walk in based on what I'd seen from above, I had my 35 millimeter Nikon hanging around my neck. And I had learned uh, in other work that I had done in the United States, I would always come in anything I was doing, animal mutilations or whatever. I would bring the camera up and I would start taking photos as I approached. And I found those photographs to be so valuable to me in research. And that's what I did. So I'm walking to the edge now of this big crop formation and I'm lifting up and taking photos. And my intent was to go through the edge now onto this formation and take close-ups. And as I started to try to move through the edge, it was like a warm jello, it's what it felt like, that I walked into something that had substance right along the edge of this crop formation. And I stopped and backed up and reached out and I could touch it again, it felt like warm jello. And I was so puzzled. And everybody else was at the far end this way because I was going to that way. So I wasn't talking with anybody. And I came up with my camera and I went oh, like higher than I would have. And I started taking photos. And as I did, I moved forward and I felt a release, like something let go of whatever this warm jello was. And when I walked into now the circle, I suddenly felt like that I was uh, almost violating. And I, I bent down and this was the one crop formation right at the beginning that I felt seven layers. There were seven layers crossed with different 90 degree angles all the way down. And I went down to where I could get dirt. I could feel dirt with my fingers. And it was up to here on my elbow. 
So it was that deep. People think they're flat. No, many, many, many complex layers. See, now, Linda, I think similarly to you in that that person who came up with the idea that this is some rather than a rather than an intent to communicate, it's an artifact of a calibration technique that the crop circles are. So what led him to think that? The man who approached me and said that he knew somebody in the CIA. Who knows? I mean, in all of my professional career, uh, it seems to me that you, when you begin intensely studying something, investigating, however you explain it, there will be people who end up giving you information that becomes a key. I have experienced that over and over and over, almost sometimes as if there is a, a sense of uh, being directed to look at things that you would not normally. And why does that happen? I don't know. But in crop formations in that day, I think back of how many people would end up walking into a crop formation and saying X, Y, or Z, and then you are learning something new and you just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And all that work that I did with W.C. Levengood uh, doing and collecting soil and seeds and plants and all of the things that we did for at least a decade. He was a, a, a very, very uh, detailed, intense scientist. He became convinced that there were energy systems that were coming through the ionosphere and that they were spinning. And he gave all of the hard physics reasons for why he came to those conclusions. And he was doing his own independent paper. And then we learned that another physicist in Holland is also had been collecting soil plants and uh, samples like uh, his himself, like I was doing for Dr. Levengood. And both of these biophysicists end up producing papers with the same conclusion that there were spinning vortices of charged particles mm -hmm. that were coming down and that the charged particles were then affecting the plants in whether they were going to stand or go down and that the complexity of the patterns was signaled by what they thought was happening in the swirling patterns coming from the ionosphere. So two completely different scientists did these papers. I got to meet and work with both of them. And my point is, there was no precedent. The, the, this was all dependent upon people who had physics backgrounds, biology backgrounds, who became so interested in the phenomena of weaving 90 degree angles all of the geometry and math that seemed to be inherent in these crop formations that attracted men who were professional in biophysics and then ended up producing papers that led to a question, what would cause a spinning complex of energy coming down through the ionosphere that would go all the way down to crops in fields all over the planet. This was not happening just in England. And no one had even uh, confronted such information before. Linda, here's a personal question before we get to audience questions. It's something I think about as this channel gets larger. How cautious are you that you're being used as a disinformation agent unwittingly? I started in 1979 as director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver. I had been doing all the medical programming for the ABC station in Boston before I was hired at the CBS station in Denver. Before I did all the medical programming in Boston, I was doing all kinds of science and environment reporting for KNBC in Los Angeles. At Stanford University, my master's film was 
their very first efforts to use computers to analyze particle bombardments in the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Everything in my work from 1968 up to uh, being hired at the CBS station. And then in 1979 there, the headlines about animal mutilations, everything in my professional life was science, medicine, and the environment. Proving hypotheses with evidence, working in labs, collecting enough data that you can hypothesize X, Y, and Z of whatever the issue is. So my training and my life was always in the context of science and medicine as it is to this day. The animal mutilations, which are physical evidence all over the planet, that I start going to animal mutilations with formal and solution and a scalpel or scissors so that I can cut the mutilators an excision to send to a, a lab, which I did many, many times, was also part of the whole building of a context. This is not something that could be done by, by a human because hearts would be found and necropsies missing inside of a 1700 pound cow or a 2000 pound bull. The heart would be missing the pericardium that surrounded the heart would be collapsed in the chest. No clotted blood, no fluid, no surgery on the outside of the body. I took that evidence to a doctor at Rose Medical Center in Denver. I said, how would you take a, a nine by 11 by 12 inch heart out of a grown cow or a bull without any surgery? And the doctor, that is in my uh, documentary, A Strange Harvest, talking about this, said, you can't. But he said, what this reminds me of is, Linda, I have, in my own medical experience, I have this idea that maybe in uh, 50 years from now, we will have molecular extraction surgery. And it will mean it will be frequency, and a frequency will go through the skin, the cartilage, the bone, and maybe it is going to operate on a gallbladder. And nothing else will be affected because it will be molecular specific surgery. It's now 2022. We do not have molecular specific surgery on the earth even now. And yet in 1979, 43 years ago, when I began my very first research of the animal mutilations, finding through necropsy, and talking with doctors and labs that what was being found in the necropsies of the animals was impossible. The removal of organs from inside bodies with no surgery, surgery on the surface. So from my point of view, there is uh, any, any suggestion that I would be in ever at any point in my life following somebody around or something around is preposterous to me. Let me repeat the question. I, I mentioned that I wonder about, it's so difficult to study this field. Linda, as you know, you've been in this for decades. It's so difficult because there's so much disinformation. It's fraught with disinformation, contradictory information as well. So, what disinformation has the implies that someone had the intent of spreading it, whereas contradictory may just be varied reports. So when it comes to disinformation in particular, how, what do you do to prevent yourself being used as a disinformation agent and, or what burden of proof must someone satisfy in order for you to promulgate what they're saying or have them on your show, etc. I just outlined to you, my entire background has always been in medicine and science and the environment. Therefore, I approach every single project that I have ever done. What can be proved, what laboratory work can be done, what 
experts do I go to? That is the modus operandi of my work. If the CIA, NSA, DIA, and the other 15 intel agencies over the last 45, 50 years, or 80 years, going back to World War II, were told that they had to keep the public from knowing anything about extraterrestrial biological entities mutilating animals around this planet at all costs. And in 1979, I'm an Emmy Award winning Peabody honored producer. And I take seriously an investigation of animal mutilations. I've been told, Linda, you broadsided the United States government. Why? And the answer that came to me, this is literal, because I've never forgotten it. They never thought that a credible journalist would touch animal mutilations with a hundred foot pole. Still. I have never ever once been afraid to look at evidence to get professionals to develop evidence. That is the hallmark of all of my work from Stanford University. I was at Stanford University working on a master's degree in communication from 1966 to 68. My work there, I did a documentary for the Stanford Medical Center that they used for 19 years after I graduated. And they sent me a beautiful letter thanking me as a master's degree student doing a documentary with the Stanford Medical Center that they used for 19 years. My master's thesis, was, was Stanford Linear Accelerator for the very first time trying to see if they could use computers that could do the labor intensive analysis of atomic bombardments. So I'm saying that from my being a person in their early 20s, getting a master's degree at Stanford University, every single thing that I did from there on was still in the context of everything that I had learned and applied in all of the medical programming, science programming and environment programming that I have done and have earned Emmy and a Peabody for. So I'm not a person who goes, goes off, well, here's one other point. The intelligence agencies, when they are ordered the way we can hurt her or him is to try to discredit their work. That is a old and tried intel control mechanism. That doesn't mean that when they float whatever they're going to float, which I've seen preposterous things come from the government about animal mutilations, all I can do is be the science medical, med, med, all I can be is the science, medical and environment investigative reporter and producer, writer, director, editor that I have always been. And I am to this day. And disinformation that the government of the United States and other governments work in 24 seven wherever they're trying to apply that rule, let's make people look over here because we don't want them to look here. Well, my entire career has been, I want to understand what's here, not what they're trying to make us look at over here. And I'll give you right now what the government did this, the shiny ball, everybody look at this. It was a mantra. It was a mantra as if it had been delivered to veterinarians and people on purpose. Just tell reporters that the animal mutilations are done by predators, disease, or satanic cults. Nonsense, absolute nonsense. As soon as you started doing any kind of legitimate physical evidence, which included necropsies and finding organs disappearing from inside of animals with no surgery on the outside. But this shows how easy it is for governments to, dis to deflect people's attention over here 
and they do it on purpose. And it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of fortitude to understand what the government is using as deflection and what is really going on. And the way to do that is to take every single subject and you approach it from a scientific, medical, investigative, what is the hard data? Okay, we'll get to some audience questions. This one comes from Dan from That UFO Podcast. He says, cattle mutilations are phenomenon that have mystified people for a long time. You've been involved in the research. So what are, what interesting results or correlations have you found? So I'll make an augmentation to that, Linda. I'll say, what new correlations have you uncovered or surmised in the past two years? Because your work is so vast, I'm sure it's changed. I would say the remarkable aspect of animal mutilations is that they have been reported on this planet going back as far as one case, 1904 in Australia, but the most numbers of cases starting in the 1950s and the 1960s is how unchanged the phenomena has been. Uh, we're talking decades of animal mutilations in both hemispheres around this planet. And the description is the same going on if you are going back uh, with 75 years. Ear missing, eye, tongue, jaw, genitals, rectum, and no blood, wounds that are dry to touch, and that that is the description around the world in both hemispheres. Okay. Andy from that UFO podcast as well, and the links to all of this are in the description. Ufology has changed so much in the past three or four years, let alone three or four decades. How have your views or opinions in that time changed how do you see your place in the subject now? Oh, ufology uh, as a, a word means nothing to me. It means literally nothing to me. If we're talking about what are hard physical data on planet Earth that has been linked to aerial phenomena that glows put down beams where there have been eyewitnesses who have seen animals rise in a beam, lowered in a beam, humans who have said that they have been on the ground and have seen a beam come down and then they're taken up in a beam. That's called eyewitness testimony from other humans about something that they have seen. And then the physical evidence in this case are the animals. Thousands and thousands and thousands of domestic and wild animals around this planet, going back to at least the 1950s and the early 1960s as a beginning, have been affected the same way. There were so many reports of serrated edges in the United States, for example, and Canada, in the 1970s that sheriffs and deputies kept referring to them as cookie cutter cuts. That is evidentiary. You've got eyewitnesses. You have a phenomenon that does not change. It keeps repeating. This is the animal mutilation phenomena that sheriffs and deputies came to the conclusion as Sheriff Tex Graves told me in Colorado in 1979, the perpetrators, Linda, are creatures from outer space. It was a shocking statement, but I emphasize again, everything in my working world for the decade before I started on mutilations, graduating from Stanford in 1968, being hired uh, at these different stations and I did not start on a strange harvest till 79, so a decade later. It's the same approach. I go to veterinarians. I pay for necropsies. I went to labs. I looked at reports. That's what I have done that has absolutely nothing to do with, quote unquote, the word ufology. Okay, you've just heard the themes of UFOs, consciousness, skinwalker, 
all topics that would make the traditional skeptic scoff. However, it may be the case that there's a paradigm shift coming. Luckily, Shortform has compendious book summaries on the topics of UFOs, consciousness, spirituality, psychology, philosophy, and the meta issue of anomalous data leading to radical reorientations on scientific understanding, such as Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions which is the short form book I was reading most recently. If you're like me, then there's a variety of books on your Kindle, which are essentially left unread. There's a variety of tabs, I'm looking at them now, which are left unread, and then I have to end up bookmarking them for later. Short form makes learning what I've already wanted to learn an eminently trivial and quick task. What's great is that you can also get yourself refreshed on books you've already read, since most of the time you would rather read a summary than the entire book again. They even have exercises that will prompt you for attention, since there's little point in accumulating knowledge if you're simply going to forget it. To get a five-day free trial, visit shortform.com slash TOE slash TOE, and the first 500 people will get an additional 20% off the annual subscription. Pause this video if you have to and visit them right now. Their UI is exceptionally clean and me, as someone with a taxophobia, genuinely appreciates that. Actually, Shortform just informed me that the Toe audience will receive an additional 20% off the already discounted annual subscription, giving a total of 46% off when you visit shortform.com slash TOE. Now back to the podcast. This question comes from Moon Observer Gillis or Gills. And I'm going to combine a couple because they're similar. So big fan of Linda here. Why do you think ETs have not appeared in person? And I'm not talking about UFOs, but revealing themselves to the entire the entirety of humans. Let's say at New York, Los Angeles, but it doesn't matter. We know UFOs exist, but who are in them is not clear. Okay, why haven't UFOs revealed themselves to the entirety of the human race? In December of uh, 2021, I did an Earth Files report about Haim Eshed. He is the father of satellite development in Israel. And in the process of wanting to be able to get a full English translation of the epilogue of his memoir that came out then, I contacted a man who had volunteered to do translations for me, uh, Hebrew to English, and I was able to get the entire Haim Eshed epilogue, which is titled, We Are Not Alone. That's the title that this uh, longtime satellite um, histor hi historic figure uh, put on his own epilogue. And in there were photographs of strange structures on Mars. He included UFO stories that had happened in various places and were investigated by anthropologists and others. And one of the questions that I said to the uh, Hebrew English translator is, does Haim Eshed have any insights from all of his work having to do with the development of satellites? Does he have any insights about why all of the other intelligence that he is implying exists in his own memoir. Why are we on a planet that is still living in this strange straitjacket? We are the only intel intelligent life in the universe. Why? He obviously knows that there is something else, other intelligences. And the answer that came back to me from the Hebrew to English translator is Haim Eshed says that the release of the truth is not for a human timeline. It is the timeline of the others. Why? Why would the non-humans want humanity to remain in the dark about their existence, their presence on our planet in this solar system what is it that the non-humans gain by us being kept dumb and blind for centuries about the fact that we're not alone in this universe? It is allegedly teeming with life, but certainly our government since World War II knows that extraterrestrial biological entities, a phrase that comes from the Truman administration, that is in documents, extraterrestrial biological entities. That isn't made up. 
late in the 21st century. Those, are, those words are in documents that have been released or leaked from the 1940s. Our government may have run into information that they found disturbing and that they wanted to understand just like Haim Eshed before they released. Now we are at 2022, decades and decades of animal mutilations, human abductions, military pilots talking to investigative reporters like me, learning about the fact that our nuclear missile sites have had interactions by UFOs that have been able to bring a missile down or 10 down, complete control. So I stand at 2022 with not a single question or doubt that the Milky Way galaxy is teeming with other life. And our government has known that for a very long time. And we are still being insulated and controlled by them not officially announcing. As long as it is not officially announced by governments, it is still quote unquote interpretive. But from my point of view, we've had the breakthroughs because we have had physicists and military people and scientists and intel who have said they've been in a room with an extraterrestrial biological entity. They know that animal mutilations are done by extraterrestrial biological entities. There is all of this firsthand testimony. And what the intel agencies have been able to do is still say until they announce anything formally, it's still speculation. And that's, from my point of view, it's nonsense because I know what I have done, what I have reported alone that is forensic. It's evidentiary. And now we're in the straitjacket of there are so many whistleblowers that are coming from every direction in multiple countries now. And they seem to be overly irritated by the fact they know that there are non-humans. They know about these very advanced craft. And they're frustrated themselves that we're not being told a truth which they thought would have been opened up by now. So why is it being dragged out? And will the new web telescope finally be the tool that all of the scientists on the planet, including Haim Eshed, would agree? Use the web. We know it could show our artificial structures on a planet at Alpha Centauri 4.2 light years away. The telescope could be used as, oh, now we can announce. Meanwhile, for centuries, extraterrestrial biological entities of many kinds have interacted with and harvested from our planet, the solar system and beyond, and our government knows it. Do you think that some of the reason why it's being concealed slash obfuscated by both the government and the aliens themselves, supposedly, do you think that the reason is for our own good, like Tom DeLonge thinks? Or do you think there's a nefarious reason, a selfish reason, one that one of cupidity or glossity, greed? Since since 2014, and a discussion that I had with a physicist who has firsthand information about certain types of non-humans and their interactions with this planet, our solar system and beyond. He gave me an insight that I think is absolutely accurate because it has been referenced in other documents that I have seen since 2014. Linda, there really is a threat. It is in the form of a very particular kind of life form that we know is only about 10 light years from the earth. And it is a threat. 
But I can also assure you that we are working in collaboration with tall whites and tall Nordics, and they are allies, and they have the ability to fend off the threat. But the government's point of view is that as long as there is a potential threat, it is easier to do the secret work of doing monitoring and interactions with non-humans like the tall whites and the tall Nordics without the world being concerned that there could be a threat from some other direction. And he spoke just like that to me in 2014. Over the last three or four years, I have heard similar statements from people who work in aerospace as engineers, people who are working in biological sciences, people who are working on what would essentially be the, how are we going to open up the Alcubierre warp drive to the planet as a technology that would get us point to point in the universe before we've even introduced the non-humans who have helped us get that technology. And you begin to realize that it is very complex when you have an entire planet that has been kept in the dark on purpose for centuries, that the uncorking of the truth, that governments and Intel have had a lot of information developed since World War II. And when it comes to how do you open up the truth, if you compartmentalize the truth and you leave out that there may be a threat, in the end, you still have another problem. So I understand that what is occurring, they're trying to get all of these various pieces now in place so that there could be a discovery through something like the web, which then it's, it's far away. And then eventually they will be opening up all of these facets that they have had since World War II and learning more and more about. <clears throat> so essentially, I don't know if you could say that the CIA, which was formed in 1947 at the same time as Majestic 12, did they have a control reason that was just because they wanted the CIA and then eventually the NSA and the DIA and all that have been have evolved 17, 18 intel agencies. Did they want the control because they wanted to make sure how it would be introduced to the world to keep everybody calm? In that regard, it may be that government denials for decades is because they did want to help humanity get to a point where they could hear the whole truth. There are as many arguments on the other side that it has been corporations, government heads and power brokers of earth who have wanted to keep the power that they have in the knowledge of extraterrestrial biological entities to them. If you keep that kind of information bottled up to a small minority, they have the most power because they have the secret knowledge. I think both have been going on and that we are finally in 2022 out of a huge, horrible pandemic that it is beginning to be really clear that they can't keep this secret much longer. They have got to open up the truth that we are not alone in this universe and that why we Homo sapiens sapien exist is because of genetic manipulation on this planet by many different species for many different reasons. But for us to be kept dumb and blind for another century would be such an abuse that I think that the tall Nordics and the tall whites are convinced. Humanity needs to be told the truth. And if they are told the truth with allyship that could handle a threat, we will grow up fast. But at least 
the earth would get out of this straitjacket of denials and lies that we are alone in this universe that has at least three trillion galaxies? Okay, this question is related to that. This one comes from Jesus Barabi. Linda and Kurt, I love what you're doing. Please ask a question that pertains to Skinwalker Ranch. And if known, how many different alien species there are potentially? You mentioned the tall blondes, the half whites. Uh, I have been told that there are at least 168 different civilizations uh, in our Milky Way galaxy. And there are 3 trillion galaxies. So you might take 168 and multiply it times 3 trillion to get the estimated number of civilizations in this particular universe. The issue of, I just had a thought explosion. Sure. <laughs> St to, to give that question yeah. to me again. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So please ask a, ask a question that pertains to Skinwalker Ranch. And if it's known, oh, yeah. how many species there are potentially? And also just my sub question, if you can hold this in your mind, I'm curious, are there competing are there competing motivations between the different aliens so that is and i also don't like to use the word alien but just just for lack of a better word are there different reasons for certain ones interacting certain ones not are some of them in favor of mankind and others don't like those who are in favor of mankind etc I have no personal knowledge whatsoever as an investigative reporter and a producer, writer, director, editor about motivations of other intelligences in this universe. The only thing that I know is somebody is doing the bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. Something is doing the abductions of humans and have been doing it since at least the early 1960s and both of those. Military people testify about their own interactions with UFOs on the ground, in the air, that there are dozens and dozens of firsthand testimonies about the intrusions of ET type craft where we have Minuteman missiles and nuclear, uh, nuclear sites underground. So it is a huge number of different facets of whistleblowers and testimonies that we, now come to in 2022, that there's no doubt from people who have any education whatsoever about what is happening between non-humans on this planet and a variety of phenomena, that we are not alone in this universe. And once you are there, we're not alone. And there is a lot of testimony about the types of civilizations that exist between here and out 12 light years, 20 light years and so forth. When you hear on TV or in news that there is a ranch, like the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, I've been there, and that people who have lived in a ranch house have seen orbs like the size of ping pong balls come in through the walls, orbs that float around in the house, uh, animal mutilations, strange shape-shifting animals, all sorts of strange things. You realize that where the introduction to most people on the planet has always been in kinds of phenomena that are spooky and scary. And that may or may not be a legitimate tool for why our government and other governments have decided that they will just allow the spooky nature of something like Skinwalker Ranch to be a self-perpetuating story because in a way it, it, it deflects from people knowing anything about what's actually happening with the phenomena, with the technology, mutilations, abductions, except in this one place. So I have always thought of Skinwalker Ranch as being one of those where it focuses down and therefore it seems it's manageable it's on a ranch, ah, it's been there for centuries. Uh, if, when you read about what the Navajo and the Utes reported 300 years ago, 300 years ago, in journals and things that have been passed down and then have been repeated, 
The Utes and the Navajos always considered the Uinta Basin, which is where the Skinwalker Ranch is, to be a place of what? Shapeshifters. The whole issue of Skinwalker, that is a Native American name that goes back to uh, 300, 200 years in Navajo and Ute stories. What would the shape-shifting be from 200, 300 years ago up to 2022? When you jump over to the human abduction syndrome, there are hundreds of stories of people seeing something that looked like one thing in front of them and, and it morphs into something else. Um, a lot of descriptions by people in the abduction I could see, I was standing on my bed and I could see through this reptilian next to my bed. I could see the dresser through the being. And then I knew whatever I'm dealing with, it's not flesh and blood. It is a projection like a hologram. Same type of issue at the Skinwalker Ranch. Projections, lights that might have been like a hologram as well. So, whether it's the government, whether it's the non-humans, the, the entire slice of human witnesses that have reported all of these uh, complex phenomena for so long, the Utes and the Navajo going back 200, 300 years. It is as if there have been locations on this planet where non-humans have based themselves and where the bases are, are where there are chronic centuries of phenomena. And I think that that is a true assessment today of planet Earth in 2022, that there are areas where there are non-humans based underground, under oceans on this planet. And those can be areas where there have been phenomena. And then there can be other areas where there's no phenomena and there's no bases. That is another, I think, calculation by the governments. They know where there are non-humans that are based on the planet and out into the solar system. And as long as they know that the general population is not living and being uh, exposed to things like Skinwalker Ranch, they can get away with not explaining anything. But what I'm seeing between Skinwalker Ranch, ancient aliens that I've been in for the last 15 years, is that the TV programs that began to develop my own work, there are so many people now, the population of people who have had interactions with non-human beings is really large on this planet. And people have not felt comfortable in the past to ever talk about it, gnomes, fairies, probably all of it was the same phenomenon. Now the population, the percentages of people listening to any given, uh, whether it's a broadcast or whatever it is, they've had their own experiences and they are the people that are coming forward to now for the first time in their lives, speak about what they have experienced. And it is happening faster and more than I have ever seen before. It is like an inertial force that is beginning to come from humans living on the earth. That is the kind of energy that I'm hoping that our government and other governments are finally going to look at all of this and say, it is way past time. There's so many humans who are having experiences and we now need to fill in the gaps and tell the truth. And they can say it with an apology. We are sorry we didn't tell you before, but it has taken us this long to understand how complex it is. And then how many civilizations do we know about? That's where I think this is headed and that the Webb telescope will be part of it. And that hard data, hard physical data, hard images, will be how they will announce we're not alone in this universe. And then maybe we'll be back on a healthy planet, certainly healthier than one that has denied for centuries what is now a clear truth.
We're not alone in this universe. Do you see there being a connection between UFOs and Bigfoot slash orbs? Orbs seems intimately tied to the UFO experience. What about Bigfoot? In uh, my two volume glimpses of other, <laughs> excuse me, in my two volume uh, glimpses of other realities books, I have a, a fascinating chapter with a man who got a hold of me living up in Snohomish, Washington. And Snohomish is one of those areas where if somebody said, where have you had the most Bigfoot, Sasquatch, uh, UFOs, animal mutilations, half cats, everything. Snohomish half is cats? one of those areas. What's a half cat? It's a variation on mutilations ah. where the mutilations are an ear, eye, tongue, I see, I see. jaw. There are half cats and there's no blood and no tracks and a lot of half cats in Snohomish area. And uh, I was uh, working in the 1990s on the two volume when I got this first a letter and then was able to talk with him on the phone and he did illustrations. Uh, he was on a, a quite a remote, everything in Snohomish is quite remote. And he and his dad lived in a kind of cabin house and his father had asked him to go down and pull weeds in a garden. And that's what he was doing, just pulling weeds when he hears a buzzing sound first. And a lot of people say that it sounded like a thousand bees. That's the first thing they hear in the sky. And then these were tall ponderosa trees. The ponderosas start moving. There's no breeze. He is in complete still air, but the trees start doing this. Moving as if there's wind, but he's not feeling any wind. Yeah, but there's no wind the trees and then the buzzing and the trees moving because he's turned to watch in fascination here comes this silver disc clear as can be settles down right above where the trees are going back and forth then he sees what looked like two as he called them like air columns i could see that they were columns that came down from the the, the disc uh, as if they were air in air, no color. In other words, he could just see cylinders, but it was like the air had made these. And then two beings, one in this column and one in this column in sparkly leotard type suits come down and he's still standing exactly where he had been weeding. And he watches them come out of these columns, pay no attention to him, and they start walking in a path and he is, uh, should I go after them? I, I, I don't know what to do. I feel afraid. And then he said, he heard a noise and he looked up and coming down now in another one of these air tubes, it looked like a gorilla. Comes down, this air opens up as he says, it's a, what he called a Sasquatch. And now he is terrified. He said, I, I think I stopped breathing. I stopped moving. I don't know what's going to happen. But he said, this Sasquatch went right off behind those two beings. That was the story that he came to me about what happened. Then I was able to talk with the deputy sheriff who went out to investigate. And the deputy sheriff said, the path where he had watched those beings, the deputy made plaster Paris of 17 inch long feet, which a photograph is in my book. And that at that period of time, from, from that point of going out to this farm, they had mutilations, they had Sasquatch reports, they had people calling the sheriff's office saying they were hearing this high pitched loopy sound that is associated with the Sasquatch. similar buzzing or that's different. The buzzing is different. The buzzing that's is associated for the UFOs. With the okay. The high looping voice is what has been recorded by many people as associated with the Sasquatch. Recorded. And oh yeah. I have used recordings of Sasquatch from Snohomish going all the way back to the early 90s. Linda, have you ever tried CE5? CE5? Stephen Greer CE5? 
No, I don't really. So, okay. Have you ever tried any technique to induce contact? No. Have you had any experience with craft on your own, either when, well, perhaps investigating? The one unusual sky object that I have seen was in uh, Aurora, Colorado. Um, it was a documentary project and I was in Denver, Colorado, and I had been asked to go to a meeting with people about a new documentary in a bank. And the meeting broke up at around six o'clock and I'm coming out of one side of the bank, everybody else went the other, had two entra entrance exits. So I'm alone coming out of the meeting. And when I uh, came through the door and started down the stairs, I was looking at a beautiful slivered moon and thinking how beautiful the sky was, walking toward my car uh, with a briefcase on my right shoulder and something that I'll never understand made me spin when I got near a car so hard that my briefcase hit the car and I'm looking up and there was this huge, huge boomerang shaped craft. And it had, it did not have lights on it, but whatever it was made of, which was sort of like a grayish brown, it seemed metallic, it looked like that there were floors and levels in, in the front of it and it tapered and I, not a sound. And I stood there watching this move without a sound, but knowing that this is exactly the kind of phenomena that had been being reported in New York state. A book was written about it and J. Allen Hynek had done the foreword having to do with boomerangs that moved slowly, that had no sound in New York. While I'm in Colorado, and this was in 1986. So I had done uh, the animal mutilation broadcast was in 1980, May 25th, 1980 was when a strange harvest was first broadcast. So by 1986, I had been investigating animal mutilations, human abductions, and all in my TV work, and had heard people describe something like this. But it is the one and only time in my life where I saw something that made no sound. I have no idea, but it matched what was being described in another part of the United States. Man, your memory recall is great for dates and so on holy moly we were i've talking, had a fly paper mine <laughs> we were talking just the audience we were talking off air about how linda feels as energetic if not more energetic than she's felt at her maximum so that's great sure. yeah okay actually someone has a question about that brandon detroit fan said she'll be 80 in a couple of weeks and looks amazing can you ask her if alien technology is keeping her looking so great <laughs> Well, my 80th revolution around the sun was celebrated yesterday, January 20th, with my brother in Santa Fe. We had a wonderful time. And the number 80 doesn't have a meaning to me because I have never felt stronger or more energized to keep doing the work that I have been doing for 42 years, trying to get to the bottom of the UFO, animal mutilation, human abduction, government cover up. We're not alone in the universe story. And for the first time, I feel like that the timeline that we're on has to inevitably now open up to finally a whole global uh, power broker leadership admission, we're not alone. And that the pandemic, the COVID pandemic has changed so much about the world. And now I think we're going to have another revolution, which will be we're not alone in the universe and we will finally be introduced at least to some of the information that our government has about different types and where they are and what they know and that we have allies and there may be a threat, but that the allies are prepared to protect and help us. 
And that may be the way that they get this introduced to the public because everything is not simple. Everything is not light. There's a lot of complexities. And I think that's what's been holding the government back. And now going through two years and a pandemic that's been so horrible, it's almost like that a new future is opening up and part of that future has got to be telling us the truth about other life in the universe. Caleb Peters, on that note, actually, just I should say that Chichu98 had a question about the Stephen Greer and aliens via meditation consciousness. I asked that before, but I just want to give credit to Chichu98 because he had a similar question, he or she. Okay, Caleb Peters wants to know, what does Linda think about the recent Pentagon UAP footage? Is the government slowly releasing information to prepare us? I think a decision was made somewhere uh, about two to three years ago that they had to start introducing pieces that could still be argued about, but that our government knew were legitimate craft and that that's where the Navy uh, videos and what we have been shown piece by piece by piece, they have. So they don't want incontrovertible evidence because then people would say, oh, aliens exist for sure. And they're trying to prepare us slowly. Yeah, I think so. I think that the tic tac and the laying out of some of these videos that they the government knows that they are showing legitimate UFO from some other place, meaning another intelligence. They know that. But the way it's been presented to us over since 2018 is still that scientists can argue about what it is or what it means. They have not put those films out and said, this is extraterrestrial biological entity technology and we know the beings come from Sirius A or some statement like that, which that's when it will be real. Kurt, wouldn't that, you say it won't be real until the, our government and other governments are making those kinds of sentences. This is film that we know is this craft from these beings that live in this part of our Milky Way galaxy. Once that begins to happen, which is what I hope will still occur in the next year or two, uh, then it becomes real. Otherwise, it's exactly, it's more of a deflection. Here is film and Lou, uh, uh, Lou Elizondo uh, has made excellent points about the fact that some of these uh, infrared or radar are an object that's going 12,000 miles an hour and stops on a dime. And there's no human technology that can do that. There, no human could survive the inertial forces of 12,000 miles an hour and stopping. So that is in of itself, you would think enough evidentiary material that it would go the next step and physicists would say, well, that doesn't happen. So we have to be dealing with something that is not human. And yet we're still tiptoeing up to that. Rat X172 wants to know, is there evidence that timelines can be manipulated? I am told that timeline manipulation is one of the non-human technologies. But what would be evidence to a human that there was timeline manipulation beyond what people in the uh, abductions have been reporting for decades, that they saw uh, that it was 11 p.m. and then they don't know what happens, but the next time they look at the clock, it is 4 a.m. and they know something happened, but they, they call it missing time. So it, it seems to me that the abductions going all the way back into the 50s and the, certainly the early 60s, they always had this component of missing time. And missing time by definition is manipulation of time or certainly manipulation of the human mind, which loses what happens between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. 
see, the way I interpreted that question was not about, see, because we have that experience when we're standing in line, sometimes time passes or when we're driving. I'm thinking more about some of the theories around what aliens are is that they're a future human race and they're coming back in time. So I'm thinking more in terms of time travel, and we ordinarily think of time as having one dimension. Well, what would it mean if it has multiple dimensions? So I'm thinking in terms of that. Have you seen, heard of evidence regarding that? The aerospace engineers and the scientists that I've talked to in the last 10 years about what they call manipulation of time technology has to do with how the advanced civilizations can literally manipulate timelines to their advantage. Something that I think is almost incomprehensible to the human mind. We live in a timeline that we have no influence on. And yet we are dealing with other intelligences that appear to use manipulation of time in order to abduct us, in order to accomplish whatever their work is. And the only residue that humans end up with is it was 11 o'clock and when they become conscious again, it's 4 a.m. So the idea that we are dealing with intelligences that would be us from the future, I personally don't think that that is uh, obvious to me as much as that there are other intelligences from other solar systems that have had involvement with our planet, as the DIA guy told me in 1999, for at least 270 million years, that there have been conflicts, tremendous amounts of genetic manipulation on our planet by extraterrestrial biological entities. And we are one of the products. So that Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien is the latest example of what ETs manipulated in DNA to create. And Neanderthalensis would have been another standing up humanoid before us. And that leaves then the mysterious question. This leaves the question, why was there a crossfade from Neanderthal to Cro-Magnon 45,000 years ago? The Neanderthals ha had even a larger brain capacity than what came in the Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapiens skull. So they were big. They know from anthropology and archeology span uh, investigations that the Neanderthals put flowers on the graves of their dead. That means that they had a spiritual component. What? was the reason that Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien current humanity replaced Neanderthal? I don't know. Well, those are the questions that you run into when you're talking with people coming at this from a long career of scientific investigations. These are the kinds of questions they have. There's this question that keeps coming up over and over, so I can't say the specific username because there are many usernames. So one is Mark Medwed, and another is, well, it's just what's the latest in Antarctica? Before 2018, I had talked with a whistleblower at a conference. Conferences before COVID were one of the best ways to have people who have served in military or intelligence. They can approach you in a crowd, you're covered by noise. And I have found that to be one of the more successful moments where you will get information. And usually it's verifiable later. So I'm in a conference and a man approached me and he said, you really need to know that in Antarctica, there is some kind of a huge gigantic base. It's been there for maybe millions of years and it is 
uh, in the category of being an extraterrestrial creation. It's not from humans. And he said, and I have a friend who is a Navy SEAL and you need to hear from him firsthand about what he has seen on a mission there. That's how it started. Is this Spartan one and two? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so within uh, about two or three months after that discussion at that conference, I got letters, I got documents, DD-24, 14 forms that all people who have served in the military in the United States must have on the backgrounds of these individuals. And we were working through mail as opposed to the phone. And I proposed in mail a place that I could meet them and that I would be able to record them about what they knew about a, a base in Antarctica. And in the late summer of 2018, I was able to make that meeting and the uh, Marine Spartan II and the Navy SEAL Spartan I came. And for uh, two days with me running camera, <laughs> audio set up, we uh, talked through what they knew firsthand. And it was under the condition that I would voice alter and keep them in silhouette. Mm -hmm. And after I released my documentary, Antarctica, Alien Secrets Beneath the Ice, at the end of 2018 and into January of 2019, I got another contact from a person in New Mexico who says, you need to meet, he's been to this base that you're talking about in this documentary with Spartan one and two, three times. And so I had another meeting, but not, he would not allow it to be recorded. So I got to hear from yet another Navy SEAL who saw my work and was provoked and what he added was three times in an even bigger scientific context that we were able to find through deep ground penetrating radar evidence and have that evidence of this huge underground installation, which is how the SEALs came to go down there. They did missions and specific missions. And they both knew that the walls were some kind of basalt and that there was language that was equally, they measured it with laser measurements. Every single symbol, thousands of them, was exactly 2.14 or 3.4, I don't remember exactly the decimal, that the symbols, as if they had been created all at once, at exactly the same depth over all of the walls in this big installation deep underground. And the, to have the first two and then have another Navy SEAL be able to take me further with more details has strengthened uh, what I think isn't going to be another one of those someday we will be told that there is a huge installation two miles they, the, all three men said that it was at least two miles under ice and that the closest place that we would know would be Beardmore Glacier. And Beardmore Glacier is famous with a C-130 crew that had been flying in the 1990s in Antarctica for several months on missions and they would see silver disks come up out of the Beardmore edge, not over the glacier, but on the edge, and that they had discussions as crews. Why do these silver things come up and they never cross over the Beardmore Glacier? So that had been another part of why the Navy was interested. What are these silver craft that are coming outside of Beardmore Glacier, but in that general area? 
So I have had several different facets from several different people, but the strongest being Spartan One and Spartan Two for my film. Do you believe those crafts or crafts that UAP phenomenon in general is physical? This comes from Kinger 90210 because Bigelow and his institute, the Bigelow Institute, and others are slowly coming to the conclusion that this is more of a consciousness phenomenon. It's both. It's consciousness. The universe is conscious. Interacting with brains. I interviewed Roger Penrose about this very issue back in 2018. And he and uh, Stuart Hameroff uh, down in Arizona, they have had hypothesized that we have brain tubules that have been just discovered in 2014. And their speculation as scientists was that the universe has consciousness that can interact with other conscious life forms. And that this is a very important part of humanity's future if we will just be taught and educated about this. And that consciousness means that you might be able to concentrate on light and affect the frequency of your mind and your soul and your body to create a relationship between a conscious universe and consciousness. But that doesn't mean that the universe that is conscious, as Roger Penrose would say, and the brains that are in it, it doesn't mean that everything uh, is in a state of just energy vibrating. Matter, this is a matter universe, matter beings, matter craft. So both are present when you get into these discussions about advanced intelligences. They're coming in physical craft, they are matter craft, but they have the ability to surf gravity waves, to bend time as it's called, like the Alcubierre warp drive and move point to point. And I have heard about that point to point travel since I did A Strange Harvest in Denver back in 1979. I met a physicist who told me that even then that they knew about UFOs and ETs that could move point to point. So matter and matter craft that can perform going from one point to another point in seconds, minutes, days, that doesn't mean that it is not a matter universe. It means that there are different abilities. The more you evolve in your, uh, in your ability to work in the universe that we're in. And that is what the famous space tunnels that are being described for the very first time in a lot of literature is about. The space tunnels are how the non-humans move around. And that is, again, coming back to the Alcubierre warp drive. We haven't been introduced to any of this as a world civilization of humans. This is coming through people who are physicists, uh, who may be investigating what's going on with UFOs, but we're still in a segmented, fragmented world when it comes to any of this information. Leaks give you hints. What we need is the whole truth and the big picture about who is interacting with us, our planet, why, and how many of our own military forces, as I've been told, have been going out to other solar systems since at least 1972. And the disconnect between what humans may already be existing in other solar systems in a military way versus a planet that still has not even been told the truth. That disconnect, I think it has to end. So this question comes from Travis Roberts at NM underscore UAP. I have seen some interviews broach the Dodie Benowitz issue with Linda, but it doesn't seem to go well. Much of Linda's information can be traced back can be traced back to Miss to Mr. Disinformation himself. I just want to know her relationship with him. You're talking about 
April 9th, 1983, uh, Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. This was a meeting set up for me by Peter Gersten, the attorney who filed FOIA, the first FOIA Freedom of, uh, Freedom of Information Act requests um, for citizens against UFO secrecy. And his name was Peter Gersten. Let's, I'll, I'll go back to get to the timeline. In March of 1983, I was in New York City at home box office signing a contract with home box office to produce an hour film for HBO. They already had the working title, UFOs, the ET factor. I had the meeting that afternoon with uh, executives at HBO and the head of uh, the documentary unit. I had already provided them a script outline of what I wanted to do in UFOs, the ET factor, and everybody was extremely excited about doing this film. That night, I knew Peter Gerson and Patrick Huege. Peter Gerson had represented citizens against UFO secrecy in the very first Freedom of Information Act filings as an attorney that led up to a Supreme Court session in which the, he had, he, Peter, had filed against all known uh, intel agencies for information about UFOs and what they were and represented. And it, finally, there was a headline in January of 1980 about this and the fact that when in on an in-camera session took place, uh, with Peter Gersten there as an attorney representing citizens against UFO secrecy, the only thing that was allowed were pages all blacked out. Stanton Friedman would use those pages blacked out for years after in his conferences, that this is what the government said to Peter Gersten on Freedom of Information Act requests about what do you know about UFOs and ETs. So that is the person, Peter Gerson, that I met with after my HBO contract signing that night. And he and Peter Huege and I uh, sat around on a small table where Peter had a briefcase and he started bringing out documents, handwritten letters, typed letters of a person, Richard C. Doty, on the documents, on the letters, who worked at Kirtland Air Force Base in AFOSI, Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Peter mm -hmm. Gerson is showing me, Linda Howe, the producer now with a new contract for HBO, look at what he is saying in these letters. And the letters were about the exchange of a, some kind of a laser, but looked like a laser beam at Ellsworth Air Force Base in which they had eyewitness military that a silver disc landed, an opening came on the side, a security guard drew his weapon, an opening came in the UFO, a blonde being perhaps uh, came out, the uh, security guard pulled the trigger or was about to pull the trigger and, and what looked like a laser beam hit the security guard's hand holding the gun. His skin was burned, surface burned. But one of the amazing things to our government was, what is that weapon? Because we want it. He dropped the gun, but it did not destroy the hand. It was surface burns. This is what Peter presented to me at that dinner that night in New York. He said, we want to investigate this. And the, this uh, AFOSI agent in Albuquerque, New Mexico has information and we wanna set up a meeting. You go talk to him about the Ellsworth Air Force Base. We want to investigate as citizens against UFO secrecy and you can cover it as a segment in HBO. Two weeks later, Peter Gerson calls, says, here's the phone number. Uh, he says he can meet with you on April 9th. 
call and confirm. So when I flew down to Albuquerque to have the meeting, it was set up by Peter Gersten, the attorney. What I was supposed to be given information about, I was told, is the Ellsworth case. When I am taken into the AFOSI office through all these punch locks where they have to punch buttons to get through doors. And we went into a, a big office. He said, my boss said to use his office. And we go into this office and as we are, there were two stairs down from the door to where the actual desks in the office were. He said, you broadsided the United States government with that film you did. And I, I'm thinking Peter Gersten and Ellsworth, what are you talking about? He said, your documentary is Strange Harvest. We never thought that any credible professional journalist would touch that with a hundred foot pole. That's how that started. That's, that's exactly where it started. And he sat down behind the desk and motioned to a chair. And I think that I am there to get the names of witnesses to the laser shooting at Ellsworth Air Force Base that Peter Gerson and I would work on as a segment for HBO. And when I asked him if he had the witness names, because that's what Peter said to ask for, he said, that's really not as important as my superior officers, I think is the way he put it, or my superiors have asked me to show you this. And he reached into a drawer and pulled out a, that kind of shape envelope and reached in and pulled out maybe 12 pages. And he said, you can read this, but you cannot take notes and I want you to move from the chair you're in to that chair. And there was a large chair in the middle of this large office. Later on, I would learn that that chair was what was used to videotape people who were brought to that office. But right then, everything is changing because I think I am supposed to get the witness names of Ellsworth and leave. I had another meeting scheduled with other people in New Mexico. But now I have in front of me on the top page, all caps, briefing paper for the president of the United States of America on the subject of unidentified aerial craft. The briefing paper did not use UFO, UAP, it was UAC and uh, uh, unidentified area ve vehicles, UAVs, UAVs and UACs. Mm -hmm. The first page was the typical Robinson panel, sign, grudge, Mantell, the airplane that was exploded by a UFO, all uh, coming into the first page. The second page, I'm reading history. And then somewhere around the third page in the middle, it came down to, a subject about in the past, in the ancient past. And it said, these extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create homo sapien. And the Latin homo sapien was there. And then it went on for two or three more sentences. Did it happen to give a timeline? Of no. No. And then it went on for two or three more sentences. And at the end of this document, tying to that paragraph, <clears throat> was a list of project names. And the top project, all caps, Project Garnet, I made a note to myself that Remember your uh, birthstone, Linda. Remember your birthstone. I'm born uh, January 20th, and the birthstone is Garnet. So it said Project Garnet, all caps. And this is exactly what it said, because I've never forgotten. All questions and mysteries 
about the evolution of Homo sapien on this planet have been answered and this project is closed. And I am a person who I'm sitting there because I thought I was doing a military Ellsworth laser shootout with a being at a silver disc. I'm being shown a briefing paper for the president of the United States allegedly that is talking about ancient history and the manipulation of DNA in already evolving primates to create humans. And that it is referenced twice in the papers from that day forward, because as a professional, when I got back to Denver, the first person I called was Gene Abinader, the director of uh, HBO documentary in New York. I explained, I came for a meeting about Ellsworth. I have now been presented a paper that seems to imply that the entire evolution of humanity is related to genetic manipulation by extraterrestrial biological entities. She said, you must come back to New York for another meeting. We must talk about this with Bridget uh, Potter and Michael Fuchs was the head of HBO and Bridget Potter, Potter was second in command. And two weeks later, I'm in New York I'm sitting in front of Bridget Potter. I explain everything I've just explained to you. I have some materials. And she said, unless you can bring to me statements or the person who is president of the United States, the vice president, the secretary of defense and the joint chiefs of staff, I will not authorize funding for continuation on this documentary. Gene Abinader looked devastated. The documentary crew at HBO, they, we had a script. We'd already had approval on the script. I have to, if I'm gonna work on any of the material that Richard Doty has talked about that they may be able to unfold, I had to talk with HBO. But that's how in within two weeks, signing a contract, April 9th, going to Kirtland, set up by Peter Gersten, and everything goes off on a completely different track. And then I had to decide, what am I going to do? Bridget Potter said, if you can uh, bring back any of those people, the president, the vice president, the secretary of defense, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and she seemed to be serious, if you can bring any of them to me, I will then reauthorize going forward on this documentary. So the rest of 1980 uh, to in, into that period of time, 83, uh, up to 80, the fall of 85, it was my money, my time, my development, and, and then the the contract ran out in uh, 1980, end of 1985. And by then I had decided that I was going to continue to try to do documentary work in this field because um, those sentences in that paper having to do with these extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA and already evolving primates to create Homo sapien, that I could never turn away from wanting to know more. Did they use the word biological to describe the aliens? Yes. Yes. Extraterrestrial biological entities are the three words that make up the acronym that they have been using for decades, EBENS all caps, E-B-E-N, little s, EBENS, extraterrestrial, biological entities. Some of the beings are extraterrestrial, biological entities. Many more than EBENS are the androids, the cyborgs, the robots that are made 
today, I can tell you that for sure. I know that we're dealing with tremendous amounts of artificial intelligence. We're also dealing with holograms. But I'm telling you what happened to your question in 1983, having signed a contract to do a documentary for Home Box Office, and exactly what happened with Peter Gersten, the attorney setting up the meeting at uh, Kirtland Air Force Base for me to go with one direction in the film to Ellsworth and everything being everything being focused on this document. And of course, my discussion then was, we're, we're talking about the creation of, of humans by extraterrestrials. Do you feel that you were misinformed by Doty? Anybody who is an Air Force office of special in investigations agent, that is their job. Counterintelligence is what they do. So yes or no. Uh, Brad is giving me a signal that my mic battery is going to die. Okay, okay. So how about we wrap up with three more questions? Does he have a time limit like, on the battery or does he just need to end? switch it? Do you want to take a, a quick break, Linda? Do you want to take a uh, bathroom break and come back? Well, I'd have to switch microphones completely. He, he's got to I switch to out the microphones. We can do that. Yeah. That why don't we take a, a two minute break? We can use the washroom. He can switch out the microphones. You can have some coffee. You can celebrate your birthday. Well, we're at 1230 and we started at 10. That's two and a half hours. We'll wrap up shortly. I just want to make sure that I get to why some of these burning just, questions. I, what about one question? Can we go one question? Give me one more question and then we'll- Sure, okay, wrap. okay, let's see. This question is a tough question. You look like a tough lady with your leather jacket. So this one comes from Steve Cambian from Truth Seekers. On your website, there's a picture of a genuine alien taken to the moon. And the image that you used was from a 2005 video game called Area 51. Cambian, so Steve Cambian is referring to himself and the third person. Cambian from Truth Seekers emailed you as the proof that what you're selling was from a video game and and then you refuse to change. So, okay, so whatever, there's some accusations there. Do you mind explaining to the audience what that picture is about, its provenance, and perhaps why you would not take it down if someone showed you it was video game art? Are you talking, what are you talking about? Okay, I will show, I can show the image. I don't have it printed here, but I can show you I can show the audience the image at some point. So are you, so you're on, you don't know what is being referred to here with the video game cover art of Area 51 and that being used as a genuine image on your website, apparently. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so let's choose a different question. This one comes from the Unidentified Celebrity Review at Lou Angeles. Has there ever been a case that you had to redact because the information was incorrect? And if so, which case? Thank you so much. Huge Linda fan. Kurt, I don't know why you are reducing the interview to this kind of petty stuff at the end. I really don't. I have been working as a professional journalist since 1968. I started at KNBC television. I went to ABC in Boston. I was hired to be director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver. I have corrected a million scripts. I have no idea 40, 50 years, how many scripts. Information, that is just elementary to being a professional journalist. And I have a tremendous number of awards that are even in boxes, 35, 40 professional awards as a journalist. Why you would end up with some kind of a stupid question like this is beyond me. It's hostile, Kurt. Why would you do this? It's, it's meaningless. What have you done that you've corrected? Well, I mean, why are you playing? Now we're going to trap Linda in some. Is this is ridiculous? 
I'm asking some of the most upvoted questions. So there's the sentiment in the community that you're a great investigative reporter, especially your early work, and that toward the end of the career, perhaps not as much due diligence in vetting sources. This is just a perception. So that's why people are upvoting it. By whom? That's not my relationship with the world. I'm just telling you, this is what many people have upvoted. So I'm asking the questions that people are interested in knowing the answer to. You're accusing me of being some gullible two-year-old and I have just celebrated my 80th revolution around the sun. I have produced literally uh, a few thousand reports at earthfiles.com, many, many, many documentaries for television broadcast. Th there is something about this, Kurt, that just feels so, so unprofessional, so unfair. It, it, I, occur, I am doing hard investigation every day and every week of my life on a variety of topics. I ask even Luis Alessandro, I ask many people similar questions about NDAs and is this piece of evidence proof? Is it proof? Do you have a public record of so-and-so? It's not as if this is such a strange question. You just said, no, you just said it's because you have a reputation essentially of being gullible. I argue with that from the face of how much I have produced. That is between my books, my documentaries, the 3000 Earth Files reports and on and on. The 15 years of the work I've done with ancient aliens. It's the opposite. I'm come to all the time because people say you do the best, most credible journalism in the field. That's what I hear. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you hear that. It's great. It's great to hear that. I hope I'm not trying to be accusatory. I'm simply trying to ask the questions that many people are, are wondering and that for whatever reason, other people aren't asking. So please, I don't mean to, to offend you. Many people are asking what? Okay, so I'm just, every time I read you a question, it's either taken from Twitter or the live chat or from Reddit or from some other places where there are likes and upvotes and people's comments on comments. And so I'm looking at, okay, what are the questions that people want to know the answer to most? And I'm simply asking them. Is that not fair? Uh, nothing about the last 20 minutes have been fair. Well, all right. Okay. Well, we'll just end this. And I apologize that, that, that you felt like it was hostile. That was not my intent. Uh, it has this out. Uh, I'm a professional producer, writer, director, editor. I have a tremendous number of awards. From my point of view, I know how hard I work for facts and that I take on subjects that some people won't touch because they're afraid. That's my answer. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. All right, I'll stick around and I'll answer some audience questions if you have any. All right.
Well, I didn't expect it to go like that. I feel bad. I did not mean to accost Linda. I didn't under I didn't think that she would interpret those questions as being. But it's great. Now I know. Now I, I understand. So for the next time, I'll be more. Hmm. Well, I'll broach the subject differently. Because otherwise, I can't just have a certain subject, for example, what is the piece of evidence for X, Y, or Z, and then not ask that question. So the topic needs to be broached. I could have broached it differently. Mark says, you did nothing wrong. She was defensive. I don't, I don't know about that. I'm sure I've done plenty wrong. I'll be watching it, and then I'll, I'll make some notes. Okay, well, everyone, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming out and watching this. Just so you know, okay, so someone just donated and asks, Warhammer badly says, were you satisfied with her answers? She was asked about CE5 in other interviews and gave different answers. Were I satisfied? Well, sometimes the answers were quite lengthy and it was difficult for me to see where the answer was to the question that I asked. However, when I did hear an answer, I was satisfied, though satisfied is a strange word because I have 40 questions that come from one question. Well, I feel horrible about that. Well, I, well, man, oh, man. Yeah, well, tonight will be an interesting night. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming out. I should get going. Okay, and just so you know, I'll be interviewing someone named Salvador Payas in perhaps one or two weeks. And Salvador is a huge fan of someone named Stefan Alexander. He's a physicist, a string theorist in particular. And there's the previous interview, the one that's up recently on the channel, is with him. And Sal told me how much he loves Stefan Alexander and loves that interview. We may be referencing some of the equations from that interview. I'll leave it here. And in that interview, if you want, you can watch it. It's extremely technical. If you want to prep for when we speak to Sal. And I would like to go through Sal's Navy patents with a fine-tooth comb. I don't know if I can do that in given the short time frame, but I can certainly try. Matt Shapiro, sa Matt Shapiro says, Kurt, you should feel bad. That was pathetic. Free Juice says, Kurt just made internet history. Luke says, you did nothing wrong. Don't beat yourself up. Well, it seems like it's a mixture, so we'll see. We'll see. I'll learn from this, hopefully. I'll rewatch it and make some notes. I feel embarrassed for myself, to be quite honest, and I, I, I'm holding back my own cringe toward myself. Okay, anyway, everyone, thank you so much. I appreciate it. There's many, many people, many people saying, Kurt, we stand by you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Krusty. Thank you, Dirt Flyer. Thank you, Free Juice. Thank you, Bert, Jan, Bolink. There's so many people. Thank you all. Thank you, Greg O'Brien, for moderating. Thank you. And take care. The podcast is now finished. If you'd like to support conversations like this, then do consider going to patreon.com slash C-U-R-T-J-A-I. M-U-N-G-A-L. That is Kurt Jaimungal. It's support from the patrons and from the sponsors that allow me to do this full time. Every dollar helps tremendously. Thank you.